Okay, everybody, welcome to the summer event for the Cambridge Power Platform User Group. I'm Sharon Sumner. I'll be your hostess this evening. It's afternoon. It's not quite evening yet. Calm down. Um, and uh, we've got some fantastic speakers this afternoon, uh, starting off with our very own Sancho. So let's get straight into the meeting rules and regulations, um, just so that we all know where we stand. It's always nice just to put this up at the beginning and sort of say, can we all just be aware of each other, understand each other, and, you know, very tolerant. Being kind and considerate to others is a bit of a mantra of ours, and we hope that you respect that during the course of today's call. So who have we got on today's call? Really exciting roundup for our summer event. So we have the lovely Sancho, who I can see here already. Hi, Sancho. Um, he's going to talk to us about learning, le learning um, exams, knowing your topic. All of those things are really key in the Microsoft ecosystem. So Sancho is going to talk to us about, you know, just because we've got AI and we're a bit of an AI focused event today. Um, doesn't mean we don't need to learn. So looking forward to that. It's always nice to get some really differing opinions on how great or not AI, Copilot and all these things are. Talking of Copilot, we're going to be then going on to Katerina, who I think is also here already. Hi, Katerina. Um, and she's going to be talking to, hello, <laughs> she's going to be talking to us about the um, AI Copilot in the terms of the Microsoft Power Platform. So that's gonna be more of an educational piece. We like that, hopefully a bit of show and tell going on there. Um, then we've got, um, I'm gonna butcher your name, I apologize in advance, uh, Shritzi uh, coming along to talk to us about the integration of OpenAI with the, with the Power Platform and those custom connectors, which again, hoping for a little show and tell, which would be great. I'm gonna finish off this afternoon's session with Divya who's been here before, um, and I think we have a recorded session from her today um, and she's going to be looking at um, actually the security and the moderation of those Azure Cognitive Services. Again, really important topic when it comes to AI is um, security and moderation. So a bit of a mix. So we're going to talk about, um, you know, a little bit of uh, insight into what, I, what AI is for and not. Um, then how we can use it and then how we can secure it. So it's going to be a really full session today. So thank you to our speakers in advance. We really appreciate your time and you coming along, sharing your knowledge with everybody. And um, I think at this point, if he's there, he is. <laughs> Last minute ditch. Um, at this point, we're going to hand over to Sancho. Oh, I actually didn't. <laughs> didn't introduce myself. For those of you that don't know me, and I can't believe there are any of you out there, um, I'm Sharon Sumner. I am your community leader. So I help bring all of these things together in conjunction with my team who are in the background. Do you want to come off? Um, do you want to come on camera, guys? If we got back here. So we have the lovely Amber who organises all the speakers and does marketing for the event. And then we have our techie back there, Luke, who is helping us out with all things technical. So, uh, Thank you very much for the Casper 365 team and Casper 365 for sponsoring the event. Um, again, those that don't know me, I'm a Microsoft MVP for business applications. I'm also, as of yesterday, a Microsoft Regional Director, which I'm super proud of. Um, and also known, thank you very much, also known as SharePoint Sharon. If you want to go and find me on LinkedIn, please do connect. I'm always happy to talk to anybody about anything Power Platform, um, AI, Copilot, anytime. Um, you'll also find me at the Scottish Summit, which is not this weekend, but the weekend after, 5th of August, where I'm going to be introducing a brand new speaker. And we're going to be talking about low code, pro code, which will be a really great session. So if you're at Scottish Summit, come find me, come say hi. It'd be lovely to meet all of you. OK, so uh, we are going to be recording the sessions today. So if you weren't able to make it, don't worry about it. That will be available on YouTube later in the usual spot. And we'll tell you where that is right at the end. So to begin with, we're going to introduce you to Sancho, who, again, is a regular presenter for the Cambridge Power Platform and one of the Casper 365 team in the back end too. So Sancho is here to talk us through um, a little bit more about um, what AI doesn't do, I think, Sancho, uh, rather than what it does um, and how you work with it. So just to keep us on theme, here's Sancho to kick us off. Sancho. Cool. Thank you, Sharon. Um, right. So let me get the sharing going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
full screen. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Sancho Hocker, um, Microsoft MVP, Power Apps Champ. Um, you can search hashtag Power Apps Champ on Twitter. Uh, Power Apps Forum super user for I don't know four years or more now. <laughs> Quite a long time. Um, some links there for you if you want to catch me on any of the other social medias or the um, super user forums. But generally, I'm known as I am underscore mancat in most of the social media places. Okay, so um, topic today is all about, well, okay, cool, we've got AI, but so what now? Because everyone has AI, <laughs> um, you know, how do you distinguish yourself? So let's start with looking at what we're really dealing with. So, okay, it's AI, but not actually. Technically, it's machine learning. It's not AI because if it was AI, a truly artificial intelligence, you wouldn't be needed. If it was truly artificial intelligence, we wouldn't be needed to do any of this because it would be doing your job. So it's just good to distinguish that technically this is machine learning. It's a machine that using vast troves of data has determined patterns and rules and logic and takes that from that data and can generate something that we can then use. If it was AI, it would be doing that, not us. <laughs> okay, so the current iterations of AI are machine learning, and in many cases, specifically, they are large language models. Um, so when they're given enough data, they can determine patterns, rules, and logic. Now, a good example of this is ChatGPT, for example. Everyone knows that now. It's, once it did its public debut, everybody wanted to use ChatGPT. Um, so what does GPT stand for, though? It is Generative Pre-Training Transformer. So the generative part, OK, it's making things. Pre-training, it has to be pre-trained. That's going to come up in a bit. And then from that, it transforms that and can generate something off the back of it. Now, I know I'm massively simplifying this, but that is the point because I don't want to go into the crazy details about how AI does that because that's not the point. <laughs> not the point of this talk, at least. OK, so what about the data? OK, so we've got data. Now, what exactly do I mean by that? Well, the majority of the current large language models are trained on data that has a specific cutoff point. That's not to say it can't get access to more recent data through lookups and browsing the internet, as we've seen in the more modern iterations of the GPT models. But what that does mean is the training that happened, the core initial training on that bulk load of data happened up until a certain point in time. For some things, that's good. So when we say GPT, we say generative pre-training transformer. So the data needs to be there for it to be trained on. So if we're going to get technical, the data for the training can't be truly dynamic. Um, so yes, as I said, we can have it potentially connected to the internet and allow it to look up more recent items and reference them and give links and draw things from that. But the logic it uses to put that into other things is based on the initial data model. OK, so that's that part covered. Now, in the case of um, ChatGPT, for example, the GPT models, uh, the cutoff date for this data is September 2021. So all of the GPT models have been trained on that data up until that date. The more recent ones have access to other data, but the core training is done with that data model up to September 2021. So big question, why is this important? So 
spoken written languages, English, Portuguese, Chinese, French, all, etc., etc., they have more or less remained static for the last century, in some cases longer, and their usage and more the words within them that we actually um, use more commonly change over time. So, you know, more recently, younger generations are using phrases that 20, 30, 40 years ago would be completely absurd, but the core structure of the language, the, um, the mechanics that determine how to structure those language pieces together has remained fairly constant. And it's that logic, rules, and system of putting together things that you can then define something around. It doesn't matter what the data that is currently being used more frequently. Um, <laughs> trying to think of an interesting one. Um, so younger generations say things like no cap. If you said that to someone who is slightly older, they have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, so for a, lot, for a model to learn from this information, like spoken written languages, this is great. Obviously, there's lots of structure, there's rules, there's patterns, and that's great. But for something that is an ever-developing, changing thing, like a programming language, there can be some problems with that because every language is on the computer side is constantly updating. Some of them, the older ones, are a bit more static. So, good example. Um, some older languages are static, like SQL. SQL has been around for ages. I mean, before I was born, SQL was there. So, you know, ages. Um, and the core functionality of that, the in SQL's case, accessing tables, the calls you make to those tables are effectively the same, but some additions and changes and moderations have been made over time to that. But the, the initial core, how it does all of that is the same. So similar to a spoken language. So what does that mean for new languages? That depends is <laughs> always the answer to things, but yeah, that depends. Depends on how new the language it is. So, for example, um, I said earlier that these things are trained on the data. So obviously, the more data you have, the more the model can use to interpret that. And in terms of Power Apps and Power Automate and um, you know more recent languages like that, versus a language like SQL, which has a much, much, much longer term and more established amount of data surrounding it. There's, you know, there's articles, books, blogs, talks, solutions, forums, code bases, um, just in huge amounts of information about something like that. That can then determine how well it can do with those things. So, sorry about that. If we look, for example, at um, Power Apps. So that's a very niche language, all things considered. It's only been around since 2015, which is which is eight years ago. It's a, it seems like a really long time. But then we look at SQL. SQL, the first iterations of it were in 1974. That's 49 years of data that's potentially available on that language versus the eight that are available for Power Apps. OK, so let's represent this in a more visual form. Uh, now, I know I'm not comparing or saying that um, Power Apps is equal to SQL or C Sharp or that you should compare them as languages for doing things. You know, they're all different tools that do different things. Um, but in, in just in terms of like the core amount of information out there, if I just search for SQL or Power Apps or C Sharp, if we had to take all the estimates you get from that on number of hits there are and show that in a graph, this is what we get. So Power Apps as a language is absolutely tiny in terms of how much information is available for 
a model to then take and determine things from it. And if we are to present that in numbers, just, and again, these are estimates and obviously they're region specific, like, you know, I did a Google search. So for me, it will be Google based around majority England and as many other world sources as it can. But as a good estimate for volume of data, this is what we're looking at. When I search for Power Apps, I get 23 million results. When I search for C Sharp, I get 463 million results. And when I search for SQL, I get over 700 million and it capped at 700 million because I don't think it can um, display me the exact number of things when I just search for a short three letter <laughs> phrase. Okay, so that really now plays a part in how much we can actually get from the model to building things for you in your apps, in your flows, in, in the Power Platform. Okay, so the next question, you've got all this data, what does it take from the data? And this is kind of a, a big part of how you need to actually understand what's going on with the languages and can't just purely rely on the AI to do everything for you. And the reason being, it's everything. The good, the bad, the half takes, the guesses. Without a level of human curation involved, it's difficult for any kind of machine learning to understand what is a 100% valid, perfect solution that follows all guidelines and best practices. Because again, to a machine, what is best practice? So your data that you're pulling all this information from is going to contain everything. It's got solutions. Yes, it's got questions. Yes, but it's also got incorrect answers. If any of you ever looked at the Power Apps forums or Stack Overflow, for every answer, there are 50 jumbled messes <laughs> is the best way to describe them because some people just have a go see oh i think i can probably solve that give their answer not necessarily the correct answer not necessarily even a complete answer so you've got um, data that contains complete and incorrect answers you've got data that contains both not completed and not correct answers and then you've got probably the smallest section of that being the valid answers. So that applies more to the technical use of it, because obviously the core language documentation for these languages is the tiniest sliver of data in terms of the proportion of all the data it can get when scraping the web. So yes, you can probably wait your, your models after fine tuning them later um, to be more heavily weighted towards the language documentation, for example. But then in that case, the code examples in literally every language, I have yet to see one where it's not the case, uh, the code examples they give you in the documentation are beyond basic. They're so basic that you can't actually use them in the real world for 90% of the things you're going to build. But that's what they're intended for. They're intended for new learners to pick up that information at the base level. Literally just the most basic understanding, because from that basic understanding, you build layers of understanding on top of that. So this means that, yeah, anything complex is not going to come from the actual documentation of the language. You'll get the, the structure, the syntax, how it all puts together, the functions you can use, what parameters you can put inside them. But in terms of building complex solutions, that has to be drawn from another source, which is more likely going to be blog posts, forums, um, and transcripts of talks and solutions. It's, it's not going to be from that documentation. So in this case, this is why in um, ChatGPT's case, regardless of the version, I've tried all the different models for it, but for Power Apps, we will see a huge number of incorrect syntax and language because a lot of that has come from 
extrapolating from forum posts. And as someone who works on the forums pretty much every day for as long as I've been into Power Apps, um, so like five years, I can tell you that the majority of that data is going to be not great. <laughs> um, so it's probably more likely that, yeah, forum posts and technical blogs would be the core volume that the next or the, the technical training will come from. It's not going to be the initial documentation. Um, so, and you're probably thinking, like, well, how do you know? Well, um, I don't know for certain, but based on the experience I have, I can take a guess. So the Power Apps forums, for example, have been around almost as long as Power Apps, so you know, eight years. And in that time, I've spent five years of that helping other people with issues on the forums. So much so that this, what I'm showing here, this list of top solution authors is top solution authors in the history of time for the Power Apps forums. So sorting it by the top most contributors, I'm in the top 10 of people who have ever contributed to the Power Apps forums. Uh, and so it's 783 valid completed solutions. So what I was talking about um, just a slide ago is those valid solutions are the ones that we really want the data to be based on. We don't want it to pull all the other um, incorrect but good try guesses. You know, a lot of people, and this is how all of us, I think, on the forum started, is you, you try and help someone. You might not necessarily know the answer, but you'll try based on your current knowledge to answer it. Now, your current knowledge may be up here but it might also be down here or somewhere in between. So you can't validate that data in terms of how much does that person know without looking at something like this. And I can tell you that no one on the forums is gonna be digging around trying to find who knows the most answers or who's done the most when they're trying to get an answer. What they do is they go onto the forums and say, hey, I'm having a problem with so-and-so, can anyone help me? And a bunch of people will chime in. And they're just happy for anyone to answer. So, right, on the forums. When ChatGPT came out and was made public, suddenly there was a massive spike in questions being sought for code that doesn't work. And the reason being is, like I said, it was based on the larger volume of data, which included all of the mistakes. And because ChatGPT is a large language model, it's trying to treat it like a language. It's not, it's not understanding that this is a programming language. It doesn't understand how that all fits in together. It's trying to treat it like a spoken language. And this can come up with a lot of issues because how does it know that this is Power Apps it's talking, or that it's French that is talking, or so on and so on? So, for example, this is a good example. So, someone came in asking that they've got a label inside a gallery. So, a fairly simple, excuse me, inside that gallery. They have a data source that is grouped by family. And this is the code they posted. So if you can see what's wrong with this right off the bat, then you understand the foundational layer of the knowledge. Because the structure of the Power Apps language doesn't allow what this piece of code has tried to do. And that's how I can look at this and immediately say, ChatGPT wrote this, because we don't do dot notation following an object to call a function. That's for things like C-sharp or JavaScript or Java. 
So where it says this item dot group by family dot first, in other languages, that might be a valid call because dot first is a function that exists in other languages. But first in Power Apps is not something you can use in dot notation. You have to wrap the whole thing in first. Secondly, first, sorry, I didn't include the last bit of the code there, not hugely important. The important bit is the first bit. Um, first requires a parameter. You don't just call first and it goes and grabs the first. You call first and then you tell it what you want to get the first of inside the brackets. But again, the language model is doing its best guess. So yeah, if you have that elementary base level knowledge of Power Apps, it's fairly easy to see with a little bit of investigation or even better yet, using the formula editor, it will tell you that this is an unknown function and it'll throw you that error in Power Apps and you can just say, oh yeah, right. It doesn't know how to call first on the property of something because that's just not how it's done. So, Okay, so I explained about how the first function needs a data source and how it's not usable for dot notation. Um, that's ChatGPT, obviously, that is like I'm using this as an example from, because everyone uses that. Obviously, things like Copilot are more advanced. How are they more advanced? I can't say for certain, and I'm not using crazy insider knowledge. My, my best guess would be that Copilot's for apps is refined on a much cleaner source, which is your apps, everyone's apps, because your agreement with Microsoft when you sign up and use Power Apps says that they can take the contents of whatever you build and use it for anything, literally anything. Um, so you, you give them that right. And so I think that they've got a treasure trove of apps that are functionally running that they can then use to train models from. But again, like I say, this is my guess. I have no evidence of this. So another example of um, code that ChatGPT gets wrong quite often is the sleep function. Because it's so often used in other languages because you need to worry about things like async and, and you know, so you, you tell the app to sleep, just pause for a minute and come back after however many seconds, however many milliseconds, whatever it is. But there is no sleep function in Power Apps. So whenever you ask it to do something with timing or timers, it will try and use sleep because that vast treasure trove of data of languages, all other written programming languages out there says sleep is the best way to do that. But not for this. Because that function doesn't exist in PowerFX. It's just you can't use that. You have to use timers and then trigger it. Okay, so when you're learning a language or a platform, there are layers to it, like a pyramid. And you build each layer on the basis of the previous layer having been established, it's solid, you totally understand what's going on there, and then you move on to the next step. So let's look at something like building a Canvas Power App, right? Here's our pyramid. We start off with something like language constructs. You want to know how it all um, fits together, what you can do, what you can't do, such as what I mentioned, where you can't use dot notation for functions. You can't just dot something and then call a function unless it's calling a flow, because then, but then it's flow name dot run. So you're not really calling a function off the back of data. You're calling a function because of the flow. Then functions. Knowing which functions exist on the platform is key. You, 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 you must know this. And at the very least, you must have a link ready to go look at the list of all the functions so that you can at least just do a quick control F and search, oh, that function doesn't exist, for example. Then you've got your data types. Knowing what type of data should be used for what type of um, data you're collecting is obviously very key because if you're trying to collect numeric values and you decide to use a single text field, technically you can do that. But when it comes to reporting time, 
you can't do things like sum or averages or anything like that because they're not numbers, they're text. Then you've got your parameters or your syntax. That's what do you put inside the functions? How do you use them? What's the best way to do that? Why can't you, for example, use first as a <laughs> sub property of dot notation? Why do you have to use first as a function? Because it's a whole function call. Um, and then work on something like the controls. Um, what controls do you have available? How do they combine? How do you how do you best use them? And that's your base layer. There you got that. Then you start moving up. You've, you've, you've covered, you've accepted all of that, and you start looking at databases, which effectively you take all your data types, combine them into a thing, and that is a database that contains lots of different data types. Then you would look at something like problem solving. I want 26 minutes, right, Sharon? Still good for time. Yes, you are still good for time. Okay. Okay, so problem solving. Obviously, you, you think about a problem and you use the bottom layer of items, your functions, your data types, your controls, your parameters, and you figure out how can I use all of those to solve whatever I'm trying to do. Then you need to secure that. So you define who can and can't see the different things, who can use the app, who can't, who gets administrative privileges, who doesn't. Then you look at things like your interactions and your connections. So you've got an app but you want it to call a flow. That flow has to call something else. Um, you've got an app that generates data, but you want a Power BI off the back of it. So you need to make sure that the data structures are easily consumable by Power BI and that your data model, for example, which is part of the whole database initial step we took there, that your data model will work nicely with something like Power BI and wherever else you need to integrate it. So you've got that now as your second layer. And again, this is not a completely exhaustive layer. This is just sort of how I think about things when I'm building and learning. So you've got that layer and now you work on your user interface. Okay, you, you know the controls. How do we put them all together for someone to use them in a, what seems like a logical way? And that together has to combine with user experience because you can have a great user interface that looks beautiful but if it's frustrating to use, the users are not going to enjoy using it and they will probably try to go back to the old way of doing things. And you don't want that. And then all of that then combines into what we would call app design. So something as simple as building an app, you need all these layers. Because what happens is when you use AI, you get put in here. The output from the AI is that. So the problem comes in if there's anything wrong with any of the other parts, or maybe it's not quite how you want it to be and you need to do a few tweaks. If you don't understand what functions there are, what the controls are, you effectively go from this point of ready for the app to be used from design level to having to understand why a control was even used or what particular function and why that function, for example, isn't working for you because the AI probably won't know about your entire data structure. There's some of it it will know depending on how you use it. Copilot is much better because it understands what tables you're using and can sort of extrapolate from that. But if you don't have this underlying knowledge, you're going to come a bit unstuck <laughs> when it comes to actually dealing with okay, my users have now asked me to change this or that, and I need something else. And you ask the AI, and it says, well, it says something wrong. And you won't know it's wrong unless you put it in there. And then when you put it in there, you're wasting time because then it shows up wrong and you don't know why it's wrong. Then you gotta go back to your base level of understanding to try to figure out why those things aren't working. Okay, so then, like I say, in reality, you won't be able to jump straight back to functions because when it's not quite 100% correct, you have to retrace your steps that you yourself didn't take. You have to now pick apart whatever this thing has made until you recognize where and what the issue is and then continue through the next steps. And that is similar to a maze. So you've got a maze, you start here, you tell the AI, okay, build me this app and we need to get to the goal in the middle of the maze there. But 
the AI gets you here. Problem is, what path did it take to get there? What is it used? How does it all connect together? So now if you don't have your foundational understanding, you need to slowly but surely trace your way back through all the different steps until you understand, and you might end up tracing it all the way back to here, and then have to figure out your own path to get towards the goal. Okay, so knowing what tool to use when, um, so this is a tool, and like any other tool, you should know what it's best used for, you should know when to use it, and how you can make use it to make your workflow more efficient. So having your foundational knowledge means you can use it and fix whatever it gives to you that might be slightly not quite what you wanted. So in many cases, you'll get given what's not quite a complete, perfectly running app that you can just start running and using, but close enough and using your foundational knowledge, you can then make it what you need for your user or your client or whoever it might be. So understanding what it is creating and how that relates to your app is pretty key. So if you don't know the above, then the problem becomes you ask the AI, you get halfway there, you ask someone on the forums for help, then you've got to wait for that person to answer you on the forum, which, I mean, sometimes it's hours, sometimes it's days. And can you really afford to wait and waste that time when, when you're trying to build things for your company? Okay, so then you get the response back, you add the code, but then the code doesn't integrate with your other functions because that person on the forums doesn't know what you've built. And then, so you set it up, you fix all the code, then you ask the AI for the next step, and this cycle just continues. If you have that underlying foundational knowledge, you can just do the first step, ask the AI, fix whatever it gave you, off you go. So it's about not wasting time. If you just purely rely on that AI, you're gonna be wasting time because you have to then evaluate and figure out what it has done to be able to do anything else. So with that core layer of knowledge, you can speed up your development, but I would say don't rely exclusively on it. It's, it's, it's a crutch and it might get taken away. If you, if you didn't have it tomorrow, what then? So, on that note, I would my advice would be to make yourself valuable. So if we like look at a hypothetical situation quickly. So in the situation, the AI has written the whole app. So long as you can describe it correctly. But if that's the case, what is your own value as an employee? Surely someone else can just describe it correctly and the AI goes and does all of it. So your value needs to be to do what the machine cannot. You need to be able to provide value over and above what an AI can give you. And doing that, you need to understand the basics and most of those other layers I showed. So that, that's what sets you apart. That's what guarantees your job security. That's what makes sure that someone else using AI doesn't replace you. Because if anyone can create that same app asking the questions that you asked, why does it have to be you? So. I would always say learn, learn your basics, learn the advanced stuff, make yourself valuable wherever you are and get that solid foundation of knowledge, the pyramid of knowledge, because the benefits of learning in that fashion where you build on top of the base up to a pinnacle for anything, whether it be app building, drawing, learning an instrument, the same process should be followed. Start small, start low, and build your way up. And so that is why, just because you have an AI, doesn't mean you necessarily have to not learn. Add me on Twitter and all other social medias. I'm always the same. I am underscore mancat. Thank you very much, Sancho. I mean, I think that's really fascinating because, um, I mean, I've even seen it's so reminiscent of human behavior so i've seen presenters who are um walking you through a demo and and even then this is why i really like your maze analogy you know as we're as you're walking through somebody else's demo um that you didn't write yourself something goes wrong you can't recover you can't cope right so it's exactly what you're saying there and it kind of reminded me of that instance where i was sitting there thinking oh god he actually has no idea how to recover 
um, and everything's, you know, broken and, and he can't move it forward. And the panic um, sets in. Yeah, and all the presenter yeah. could say was, unfortunately, this didn't happen the last 8, 10, 18 times I did it. You know, it's mm. it's really difficult to um, to work with somebody else's solution. And that somebody else, whether it's AI or whether it's actually somebody else, you know, it, it's super hard. So I get exactly what you're saying there. And yeah. some interesting points of view. Has anybody got any um, questions or challenges to Sancho's point of view on all this of that? This is the first talk I've ever given where... I didn't do a demo, just for the record. So <laughs> first one ever. <laughs> okay. Well, I think you demonstrated thinking. I think it's good. <laughs> okay, I don't see anything popping up in the questions. So um I guess I've got a, a question for you. Um mm -hmm. what you're saying is, you know it can waste time. I mean, obviously it can save time. So is there, uh, is there a balance here? Are you saying that um, there isn't a place for AI at all? Oh no, not at all. I'm, 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 I'm definitely saying you can use it. I'm saying if you don't understand your basics or even your intermediaries, using it becomes counterproductive because it can get you most of the way to the finish. But unless you know what's involved in getting to the finish using all the other steps, you're just going back to square one again because you have to then figure out how it's done, what it's done, what, how, how would you integrate that with what you're building. Um, so it's, yes, there's a balance. And I think especially if you understand your foundationals and how the code works, for example, it's, it's much quicker to ask it to do something it does 85% of it, and then you just tweak the little bits that got wrong, off you go. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I, th I think that's where we're at. I mean, the the models are context models, right? And as you're okay. saying, they're getting that context from relevant sources. I really like the difference that you pointed out there between um, kind of large language models that are taking where the volume is on the internet. So like you say, it could be dodgy questions or dodgy answers yeah. um, or, or just discussion around those topics that isn't necessarily right or wrong um, versus something like a co-pilot, which is very focused in its context. So that the more focus you give something just on this app, where yeah. would I, how could I, et cetera. I think the co-pilot has the, uh, the massive advantage there of being really context specific. And I think that's something that's growing, isn't it? I mean, we've got these um, specific language models being developed and yeah. internal business context. Do you think there's gonna be some value there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the post training, as I like to call it, after you get the model, you can then train it on more unique things like your business cases. And with um, the more modern GPT models and the paid models, you can ensure that your data is secured so you could actually feed it company data without worrying about that going out into the wild. So yes, I absolutely think that will be something we should be doing going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think those knowledge systems are a massive benefit to organizations of any size actually um, around your own um, past history. Um, you know, and I think that there's a lot that can be done there with knowledge. But I think what you're saying is make sure you understand what it's telling you, right? Yeah, yeah. If you if you don't, then you're going to have to go back and learn anyway. And learning piecemeal after the fact, once you've got like like someone gives you a car and then you have to learn how to change the oil. If you knew how to do that before, okay, that's such not a great example because no one's building cars from scratch, <laughs> but. The, the, the fact is, before I owned a car, I learned how to change oil and how to look at a battery and those kind of basic troubleshooting, the base layer steps before I had a car. So okay. Yeah, I guess what you're saying is don't give me a cake and the instructions on how to use the oven technically, take it to pieces and expect me to recreate cake, right? Yeah, yeah. you're not going to be making cake at that point. You're going to be just, you have to go all the way back and say, okay, well, what, what were the ingredients? I don't even know what the ingredients were. Okay, we have got a question that's come in. What is this? Um, this is just a general question. Re MS Fabric. Oh, so true. I'm not sure that's <laughs> that's for you, but not really my area of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Power BI will cease to be part of the Power Platform in the future? It's great, great observation actually. 
Um, just that with tech companies, I've noticed that they already used to take Power BI out of it and put towards AI and data team. The Power Platform would be with G365. Oh, I think, OK, I definitely have an opinion there. I'm sure Sanjay does. And then you would have to choose which path you want to go down, data slash Power BI or PowerPoint and D365, a Power Platform in D365. Thoughts, Sanjay? Personal opinion? Uh, they've meshed the three Power Apps, Power Online, Power BI so closely together, it's hard to untangle at this point. I think, yeah, you're going to get advanced functionality with moving it to, to you know, syntax and all the other pieces, but the core functionality is still going to be there. You're not going to lose that. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, for me, the Power Platform is about automation and insight, right? So those tools naturally fit together. That's kind of almost like saying taking Power Apps and Power Automate apart. And yeah. That wouldn't be a, a good separation because you're going to end up, ideally, you have an app that processes business process with flows that then produces data that is analysed to give you insight. So the three fit together really well, regardless of the, um, I guess, binding of the tool set in terms of where it sits on the platform. So I think one is conceptually about the functionality, the business functionality of the tool, and the other is about the naming of where it sits technically on the platform as a service. So I don't uh, honestly think that those those will get separated. Do you, Sanjay? I think if they, if, if they split it out, you wouldn't be able to create whole encompassed solutions together. Because that's, like you say, it's, you know, you get your data, you you do something to it, and then you analyze that. Those three yep. steps are together. I, I can't see how they would, without disrupting the solution building of literally everyone, extract just Power BI out. It just, it wouldn't make sense. I agree. For me, automation is nothing without the, that insight step at the end. Yeah. Okay, um, we need to move on. So oh, thank yeah, you. I'll be in the chat. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Uh, we love having you come along. Um, let's just see. OK, so this is a Q&A um, part of the recording normally. But as we're sort of seven minutes from close, I'm pretty sure everybody's keen to get off and, and have the rest of their evening to themselves. We did run a little long, but these were really important topics. So thank you for joining us live. For those of you that didn't join us live, we will be putting the sessions up on YouTube. And again, thanks so much for coming to the summer session. We try to get a great collection of speakers for you and some diversity of topics every quarter and it's important that we get some feedback on the speakers and the content and the stuff you want to hear and preferably if you want to come along and speak get in touch we're always looking to encourage new speakers to have a platform to be able to come and share what you do and what you create so really appreciate um, Sancho, Shruti and, um, and the others, Katrina, Diva, for coming along and giving us their time and sharing with us and the rest of the, the community. And again, via YouTube, um, the whole of the topics that we've got to share. Copilot AI, it's really fundamental to understand what it is we've got our hands on and how we can go ahead and use it. So thanks for joining us. Look forward to seeing you all on the next Cambridge Power Platform user group. Do join us online. Come and join the community. Um, there's a link to it there. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all next time. I'm Sharon Sumner. Thanks for having a great session with us today. See you all again. Yeah. Bye -bye.